Yep. All right, yep. cool. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, hi, guys. Welcome to our first advanced lecture of the semester. Uh, and today's topic is string hashing. So the basic goal of string hashing um, is we want to query uh, equality of substrings in constant time, right? So basically, we have this big string S. Uh, we can do linear preprocessing on it. Um, and we want to be able to check uh, if like arbitrary substrings are equal in constant time. Um, so one quick like notation thing, uh, given a string S, we're going to let S uh, L to R be the characters SL, SL plus one, all the way up to SR minus one. So we're excluding SR, it's like a half open interval. Um, I'm not sure if this is like a thing people do, but it's like really useful notation for what we're going to uh, be talking about. It's going to come up a lot. So, uh, right, so basically the idea is, um, given like two positions in your string and a length, we want to see if the substrings of that length starting at those two positions are the same. Um, so if we did the trivial uh, approach where we just check every pair of characters and see if they match, um, that would be O of L, right? Because there's L characters, which is O of N worst case. But we want to get that down to constant time. All right, so a natural question is like, why do we want to learn this? Like, is this useful? So uh, string hashing is basically almost never the only solution to a problem and almost never the intended solution to a problem. Um, but it is usually much nicer than a lot of the other solutions. So the implementation is usually very good. Um, and you can also use it as a black box really well because all you need is the one like equality function and everything else sort of builds off of that. Um, and the nicest part about it is it means you don't have to learn a bunch of other algorithms. So I don't know if you guys uh, have heard of the Z algorithm or KMP or like the normal way to make a suffix array. Um, but if you use string hashing, you basically don't need to learn those. Uh, the one downside is in some of these, you will have an extra log factor, but that tends not to matter in CP problems. All right, so now let's get into it. So um, the basic idea of string hashing sort of like anything with hashing is we're going to uh, get hash values for the substrings such that if the strings are equal, then their hashes are equal. Um, and if the strings are not equal, then the hashes will not be equal with high probability. OK, um, so how are we going to define the hash of a string? So we can't actually loop through all possible substrings um, and then do some hash function on them, because that would take n squared time to compute. Um, so we're going to do sort of a special hash that allows us to take some shortcuts and do some nice pre-computation. So um, we're going to associate every character with its ASCII value. So somewhere between 1 and 255. Uh, the only important thing is that none of the characters have value 0, which we're not going to be using uh, whatever the ASCII character with value 0 is. So that's not an issue. Uh, so some implementations will use like 1 through 26 for the letters of the alphabet, or like do something like that. But this way, um, it's just less set up because it'll automatically convert the characters to their ASCII value if you just like treat them as integers. Um, and it doesn't actually matter if you do this versus like 1 to 26. All right, so now um, we're going to let m be a large prime, about 10 to the 9th. So if you guys have seen like a lot of code forces problems, you can do 10 to the 9th plus 7 or like the 9981 or any of those. Um, and we're going to let p be any value in the range uh, 256 to m. So the two constraints that p has to satisfy is um, bigger than any of the values of the characters. So it has to be bigger than 255. Um, and it has to be less than m, which means that it'll be co-prime with m. Uh, because if p is less than one of the characters, or if it's not co-prime with m, then this isn't going to work. OK, so now that we have all this set up, uh, we define the hash of a string um, to be basically a polynomial uh, where the coefficients are the ASCII values of the characters. Um, and you go from uh, degree n minus 1 to degree 0, where n is the length of your string or your substring or whatever. Um, and we're going to take the value of this mod m. OK. Um, so yeah, from here on out, uh, we're going to have the mod m be implied whenever we're doing like any addition uh, or multiplication of hashes or like taking the power of p. Everything is mod m. Uh, so we're not going to write that just to sort of make it cleaner. Okay. 
Is this making sense to everyone so far? Anyone have any questions? All right, cool. Wait, what's P again? Sorry. Oh, yeah. So P um, is sort of any value in between 256 and M. Um, so you fix it. P is a fixed value. OK, OK. Like you did this backward from like the one on CP algorithms, right? Is your right? OK, yes. Yes. So uh, some implementation of string hashing will do this in the reverse, where like you have P0 matched up with S0, and then PN minus 1 with SN minus 1. Um, so the reason I'm doing it this way and not that way is because this way we don't have to calculate inverses. Wait, so wait, this way we can do everything. Yeah, like yeah, it's cool. nice. That's it's cool. like very nice. Yeah. All right, uh, any other questions about this? OK, cool. Uh, so we want to do linear pre-computation for this, right? Um, so here is basically everything that we're going to uh, pre-compute. We're going to uh, compute the hashes of all the prefixes, um, as well as the first n powers of p. Um, so as you can see here, we're defining hi to be the hash of the first i characters, um, which means we go up, we go from S0 up to SI minus 1, right? Because like H2, for example, goes up to S1, and like H3 goes up to S2. Uh, so that's just like an off by one thing to keep track of. Um, but as you can see, they're all following the rule we just set up for like uh, the polynomial. So we have like the descending degrees um, for all of them. Um, and then we also have the powers of P, which is pretty self-explanatory. So if you were to just naively calculate this, like the way we have it written out, like for every prefix, you like add together all of the terms, um, that would be n squared pre-computation. Um, but you can notice that we don't have to do that. We can basically just do this. So um, for each i, you just let uh, h i equal h i minus 1 times p plus the um, s i minus 1. So we're taking the last hash, multiplying it by p, and adding s1 to it. And then that um, generates this sequence here. And then similar thing for uh, powers of p. This is pretty self-explanatory. You just take the previous one and multiply by p. And again, all of this is mod m. OK. So now we're going to get into how to compute the hash of an arbitrary substring. Um, so let's say we have some substring that starts at index i and has length l. So we'll call the hash like HIL. Uh, so based on the definition we've set up, um, this is the polynomial that we're trying to compute, right? Because you start at SI, you go up to SI plus L minus 1, you have the descending degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a term to the beginning and to the end of this. OK, um, so we're basically adding sort of this hash of the prefix before I to the beginning, and we're subtracting it from the end. So if we mess around with the parentheses a little bit and we pull out a factor of PL, we get something that looks like this. And if you notice um, the two things in the parentheses here, so this is a hash um, of S0 up to SI plus L minus 1, which is a prefix of S. And this is a hash of S0 up to SI minus 1, which is also a prefix of S. So we have both of these hashes pre-computed because we have all the hashes of the prefixes. Um, so now HIL is just equal to this, right? Because we have the hash of this prefix minus PL uh, times the hash of the other prefix. So anyone have any questions about how this works? Yeah, so this is how you do the computations without needing inverses. It's like very nice. This is really cool. Like, did yeah. you come up with this? No, 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 Th this was in a code forces block. Oh. Uh, which, by the way, is going to be linked at the end of this, if you guys want to take a look at that. OK, and yeah, again, uh, we pre-computed all the HI and PI values, so we can compute this in constant time. And this leads into the main result of string hashing, which is to check if two substrings are equal. We just compute their hashes and check if the hashes are equal. Um, so that is basically conceptually all there is to it. Um, we're going to build some more layers on it with the practice problems, but that's basically um, all you need for string hashing. So now um, we're going to get into some ways of decreasing the failure probability because um, it's not 
guaranteed that if the hashes are the same, they're the same string, right? You could get like some false positive where they just happen to have the same hashes. Um, so we're going to talk about some ways to decrease the probability of that. So the first way you can do that is by double hashing. So you can keep track of two hashes um, with different prime moduluses. Um, and you can use either the same P or different P for each mod. It doesn't really matter. If you use the same P, um, then by Chinese remainder theorem, um, it's the same as doing it mod M1, M2. Um, but if you're using different P, then you have, they're, they're basically independent. So you get sort of the same result. Um, and then uh, you can store the hash and power arrays. So like HI and PI, you can store them as pairs where like your first value is mod the first thing, your second value is mod the second thing. Um, and once you have this, you're much less likely to get a false positive on both of the hashes at the same time. That's, that's nice with the pairs because you can just check the pairs are equal directly. Too. Yeah, and we're going to get into some more like cool stuff you can do with the pairs in the implementation. But nice. that's like, it, it, it's cool. It's also kind of stupid, but we'll get there. Uh, do, do you have like a template right now for this? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to go over it. All right, uh, you can also do three plus hashes. Um, so the problem in general with adding more hashes, um, in addition to it just being a lot more annoying to implement, um, is mod calculations are very slow. So if you're doing a lot of mod calculations, that could easily get you TLE if you're using like, I don't know, like five different hashes or something. Um, so you generally want to stick to like two or less. There's also math behind this of how many hashes you need. And it turns out two is pretty good for almost all circumstances, like very good. It's called, like, if you like want to look it up, it's called universal hashing. And you can actually like, if you assume like, and you can prove that this raising things to power and taking the mod uh, a prime is gives you basically this universal hashing uh, families. And then so you can get like bounds on how bad these probability of collision is. And so it turns out like yeah. 10 to the 18th is like pretty good, which, which is what two hashes gives you. But you can actually go further than that, which is way number two. Uh, so you can make one of your hashes uh, mod two to the 64. So instead of using um, two hashes that are around like 10 to the nine, you can use one hash that's 10 to the nine um, and another hash that's two to the 64, which is like 10 to the 18. Um, and you should only do this if you're double hashing, because if, you're, if your only hash is mod 2 to the 64, um, there's cases that will break it for no matter what P you're using. So if you're using this hash, you have to have another one. But as long as you have another one, this is like strictly better than having just two hashes 10 to the 9. Um, one really nice thing is you don't have to actually mod anything, because unsigned long, long calculations in C++ are automatically done mod 2 to the 64. And I assume it's the same in Java. I don't actually know. Um, but yeah, so that's nice. And another nice thing is um, multiplication, addition, and subtraction are done the same way in terms of bits for unsigned long longs and uh, regular long longs. So you can just use regular long longs for that also. Um, and yeah, so basically, it gives you the benefit of triple hashing, but you only have to do mod calculations for one hash because you're not modding for this, right? You're only modding for your one hash, but this is basically giving you the benefit of two additional hashes. So that's like very nice. All right, and then the third way, uh, which I would say is probably the most important if you're using on code forces, um, is you want to randomize P. So at, at the beginning of your program, when you like first start it, you want to pick a random P and then use that value like for the rest of the program. Um, so for people who are no, new to CF, can you explain what hacking is? Yeah, I'm going to. Um, okay. So like I said before, the two constraints that it has to satisfy is to be at least 256 um, and co-prime to all your mods. So you can just make it less than all your mod values, as long as your mods are all prime. Um, and that's fine. Um, if you're using 2 to the 64, when we get to the implementation, I'll show you how to do that. It's You basically just OR it with 1. Uh, but yeah, as long as P is at least 256 and less than all your mods, then you're fine. Um, and doing this makes your solution a lot harder to hack in code forces. So um, hacking is basically uh, someone can submit input to your program and try to break it. Um, and before they do that, they can like download your code and like run it locally um, and generate like bad cases, right? So if they know what P you're using, um, then they can just like generate a bunch of strings with that P or something like that. There's all these ways of like 
making counter cases. And they can like brute force a counter example, and then they can submit that and break your code. But if P is randomized, there's no way that they can find a counter example for say like 10 to the ninth different values of P. So then you'll be safe from hacking. Wait, what are the odds that this will fail on like a normal, like, like, like give you a WA? Um, so I don't know for double hashing. I, I haven't had a double hash fail or one with 2 to 64. Um, I have had a single hash fail system tests. So you yeah. definitely don't want to be single hashing. And it, that time was when it passed pretests, right? But it feels right, system. exactly. Yeah. yeah. OK, so does this basically make sense? Anyone have questions about uh, decreasing the failure probability? More, and to answer Yusuf's question more specifically, if you have one mod, right, and the mod is like 10 to the ninth, then the, pro the failure yeah. probability for a single hash a collision will be 1 over m, so it'll be like around 1 over 10 to the ninth. And if you do like, I don't know, 10 to the fifth strings, right, or something, and you do like yeah. a thousand test cases all across your thing, then it can get kind of dicey to, it, yeah. you're almost certain to fail, actually, if you, like, depending how many test cases. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, um, why did you say that uh, using 2 to 64 and double hashing gives you the benefits of a triple hash? Right. So this is basically, um, so like most of the hashes you'll use will be like mod 10 to the 9, right? Um, so this is mod 10 to the 18, basically. So it's sort of, it's sort uh, of like if you multiply two and hashes. And the ease of calculation? Huh? So it's just the quantity, the size and the ease of calculation? Yeah, because you have like more mod values here, right? So the probability that um, that they'll collide on this is like one over ten to the eighteen or something. But the probability and, and the probability that it'll collide on like two smaller hashes is like one times ten to the ninth times one times 10, one over ten to the ninth times one over ten to the ninth. So that's also one over ten to the eighteen. So this is basically functioning as two hashes. Yeah. And then if you have another one, yeah. then that's basically your third. So in I terms of failure, yeah. Uh, I was just curious, like, if you could quickly explain this, like, go ahead. But if you can't quickly explain it, just I'll ask later. But like, why are you saying like this that two to the sixty four will fail in like certain cases, like almost definitely? If oh you just do yeah. One um, there's prime, like basically. these. Well, yeah. There's like this specific case. I think we're like there's these two strings of length like a thousand that have the same hash mod two to sixty four for any p. So like you just put in those two strings and you're guaranteed a collision. So someone can easily hack you, or that could like show up in sys tests easily too. That's so stupid. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know exactly how that works, but I know there's a case like that. Is there huh? no prime near two hundred? Is there no th is there no prime near two hundred sixty four? The problem with that is you can't do multiplication then because your multiplication will overflow for long longs, right? Yeah. That the reason we use ten to the nine is because you can multiply two of those together and keep it in a long. And then mod it again. But you even more than that, the point of using two to the sixty four is that you don't have to do the mod. You don't want to oh, yes. be slow also by that. doing another okay. mod. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay. So now we can get into the implementation, um, where basically we're going to be using all three of those tricks we just saw. All right. So first, uh, just some quick type defs. Uh, we're going to be using LLs in place of long long int and PLs um, instead of pair LL, LL. And note that this is going to be our hash type because we're going to double hash. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to define operations on the hashes. So we're going to overload the standard operators for pairs so that we can just directly add the hashes together and not have to like split it into the first and the second and like do the mod every time. Right, so uh, in this case, we're going to have our first mod be 2 to the 64, and our second mod be this number, which is a prime. Um, OK, so basically, the way overloading the operators works is uh, you write some function like this that takes in, like in this example, two pairs, and it returns a pair. And now, anytime you call like a plus b or like p plus q for two primes, it'll call this function. So that's like a nice C thing you can do. Um, so as you can see here, uh, when we're adding two hashes, for the first one, we just add. We don't care about overflow because it'll automatically do that for us. Um, and for the second one, we're adding mod m. Uh, multiplication is similar. You just multiply them for the first one, and you multiply them mod m for the second one. And the one thing different about subtraction is we're going to do a plus m here before we subtract the second one. Um, 
because we don't ever want this to be negative because then it'll give us a negative mod, which we don't want. So you have to make sure that this is always non-negative. All right, so this is nice and it does cut down our code a lot. Um, but if you'll notice, there's like a lot of repeated code here, right? Because these three functions are very similar. Um, and this is where it gets a little stupid and I'm not sure if other people besides me would want to do this, but I mean, I don't know, it's kind of nice. So one thing you can do uh, in C++ to cut this down is you can turn uh, this basic thing into a macro. So we can do something like this. Um, so uh, basically, <laughs> yeah. So we, we can basically cut down that code by like a factor of three uh, by doing this instead, where basically op xy defines operator x by doing operator x on the first thing um, and operator y on the second thing that's mod m. And the only reason we need to separate x and y is because like I was talking about before, you want to make sure you have this plus m. Can you not add plus m to everything? And then you won't have to do the x, y? Wait, that's big brain, you, wait. You could, but then you're doing unnecessary additions, right? What's well, an addition? Yeah, but it's, it's an addition, like. I guess, but like, I mean, you're not adding that much code just to handle that. I don't know, you could do that. No, wait, you couldn't, because like, then you would be a dot second times m. No, uh, it'd be a dot second times b dot second plus m. You just always add plus m. Oh, edit at the end. Um, okay, yeah, so th that would also work. But I don't know, I mean, <laughs> would adding that many like additions be okay? Whatever. Okay. All right, so um, if this is like confusing, then you don't have to do this. You, you can just like define operators like this. Also, if you're using Java, you can't do this. So if you're using Java, you'd have to like basically write your own class or something and then define these operators on it. Uh, at, at that point, you, you, if you're using Java, you might as well just use two different arrays instead of pairs. That's also true. But yeah, OK. OK, so th this is an option if you want to use it. But if you don't, yeah, that also makes sense. All right. OK, so for random number generation, um, this is basically what I've seen recommended in like code forces blogs and stuff. Um, because a lot of random number generators uh, won't like give you enough randomness to not be hacked. Um, so like if you use rand, I forget exactly why, but rand doesn't work. Uh, I think rand, like. Uh... It, so just real quick, as far as I understand, like I think what Rand does is it takes how long it took your program to execute up to that point, and then random generates a random number from that, like how many milliseconds it took. So like it can be predicted. I'm pretty sure, like okay. if you use it wrong. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not, that that's that's if you seed it with the time. So Rand is just is is just a random number generator. That's bad. That's that's the only thing. Uh, what you're talking about is when you seed it, you can often people often use it just seed from the time directly. And that time can be predicted, eh? and then the random generator is also bad, so you can sort of get information out of that, I think. Uh, and like, Wait, so like, is it, fine? It, has patterns. Is it fine if you don't see it? Do you have to see? You have to see. We have to see it. Otherwise, we see it with zero, and then it's, that's even worse. Yeah, exactly. But, so okay. what, but what Joe's yeah. doing here with his code is two things. One, he's using a very um, granular count, very very fine count from the steady clock thing, and two, he's using yeah. a good random number generator, so which is very unpredictable. Yeah. So um, um, okay, basically okay. what this is doing is uh, this part is just generating a random seed or not a random seed, but it's like based on like the time with like, like he said, like very high granularity. So like this changes very often. Um, so if you use a fixed seed and you try to randomize, when people hack you, they can just like run your code, figure out what this uh, generator will generate. Because if you use a fixed seed, it generates the same sequence every time. So people can just download your code, run it, see what it comes up with, and then just use that to find out what your P is. Right, so you, you have to have some randomness here. Um, and then this distribution is basically giving the range of values that P can be in. So like we said, we want it to be at least 256 and no more than M minus one. So now from here, if we call dist gen, that will give us a random P. Okay. So now for the biggest part of the code, we have the pre-processing. Um, so we let n be like our maximum n, whatever that is. Uh, we have our p and h arrays, which are the same things we uh, defined before. Um, and we're just going to let n be the length of our string. OK. Um, so we can initialize uh, p0 to 1, 1, right? Because p to the 0 will always be 1 in both cases. And then p1 is your actual p. Uh, so for the first mod, um, where we're mod 2 to the 64, we have to make sure that that's an odd number. 
So we can take our randomly generated P and OR it with one. And then for the second one, um, it can be anything as long as it's in the range 256 to M minus one, like we talked about. So we just take any other random P. So we have different P's for these two, but it doesn't matter because the way we're doing like multiplication and addition, we're calculating it all separately anyway. So it doesn't matter, we have two separate P's. Okay, and then uh, for this loop, we're basically just doing what we talked about before with the pre-computation, where we do PI equals PI minus one times PI, P1, and then HI equals HI minus one times P plus SI. And we have to make it a pair here because we have the two hashes. Um, okay, anyone have any questions about implementation up to here? All right, cool. So now all that's left is the queries, which with what we have here is very short. Um, so we just define the HIL to be the hash starting at I of length L, like we were talking about before. And this is just that quantity we had before, HI plus L minus HI times PL. Um, and EQIJL, which is like the main function we're gonna use from here on out, um, is we're just checking if the two hashes are equal. Um, so now uh, we can basically just call this whenever we need to check that. Um, so yeah, that is it for the implementation. So now uh, we can get into some sample problems. So for these problems, you can assume we've already done all the pre-processing and we can just do arbitrary EQ queries whenever we want. All right. And these problems are also gonna uh, build off each other. So when we, when we get to some of the later ones, keep the solutions for the earlier ones in mind. Okay, so the first problem is longest common prefix. So we want to query the length of the longest common prefix of basically two suffixes of S in log N time. Um, so longest common prefix is the biggest length such that their prefixes of size L are equal. So if we look at this example, if we have I equals one, so this character and J equals three, those strings are gonna be uh, this and this. And if you look, their longest common prefix is ABA because they both start with ABA. Um, but if you try to add another character onto that, then they don't match because this would be ABAB, this would be ABAD, so they don't match. All right, um, and yeah, so the goal is to do this in log n time. So does anyone have any ideas for this? You could just do yeah. by search, right? Yeah. yeah, so that's exactly how you do it. Uh, you just binary search on the length. So if the prefixes of size X match, then all the prefixes that are smaller than that also have to match. Um, and if the prefixes don't match, then none of the prefixes bigger than X match. Uh, so th the only thing you have to really be careful about um, is to not go outside the bounds of the string. So you want to make sure that you don't have your length go past min of N minus I, N minus J. Because if you go past that, then you're going past the end of the string and we don't have any hashes defined past there. Um, so that could get weird. But yeah, uh, you basically just binary search. Is everyone good with that? So in terms of implementation for this, um, it's kind of up to you. It's like whatever binary search function you want to use. So like here's um, a recursive binary search that would do that. Here's uh, iterative binary search. It, it's, it's just a binary search. The implementation is pretty much that. All right, so now uh, we're gonna get into lexicographically less queries. Um, so we wanna query if, now we have arbitrary substrings, right? So starting at I with length LI versus starting with J at length LJ. And we wanna query uh, whether the first one is lexicographically less than the second one in log n time. Uh, so if you guys don't know, a uh, string is lexicographically less than another one um, if it's a prefix or if in the first position where they differ, um, SI is less than TI. So like if we have some examples here, these two differ in the first character um, and A is less than B. So this string is less than this one. These two match on the first three. Um, and this one is a prefix of this one, which means it's less because it's a prefix. And these three match, th these two match on the first three characters, right? ABD, ABD but E is less than F, which means this one is lexicographically less. Um, so ideas on this. 
I'll give you guys a minute for that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, uh, it's kind of like the same thing as last time. You find when they're equal, and then you look at the character right after when they're like equal. Yeah, so that handles um, this case. And then, oh, wait. Then how would you do this case? This is the easier case. Go to the end of one of the strings and see if it has the same. Uh, like, go to the end of the shortest string and then go to the same position. Then see if uh, their hash is equal. And if their hash is equal, then you know that one is a prefix of the other one. Right, yeah. So we have these two cases where if one of them, we, we want to check if one of them is a prefix of the other. Wait, no, no, OK. So if one of them is a prefix of the other, right? So we get their minimum length, right? Oh, this should be i plus that. Um, so we look at the strings with the minimal length for these two. Um, and if they match, um, then that means one of them is a prefix of the other, right? So like, let's say li is less than lj. Then that means that uh, s starting at i is less than s starting at j. Uh, if lj is less than li, then this one is less. So if we find out that one of them is a prefix of the other, we just return um, is the first one uh, a shorter length. Can I wait? Can I ask a question? You can like check lexicographical order in linear time, right? And the precomputation also takes linear time. So like, I don't know. I just don't see why this will be useful. I don't know. Uh, just... You can't check lexicographically. No. So this is in log in time. We're we're creating this in log in time. Because uh, this is just a single hash check, right? So this only takes constant time. But is there like an example you would need to do this in log time if you're yes. doing it in linear time previously? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're going to get to some later problems where these really build on each other a lot. Um, Yusuf, you're kind of right in that there's a constant time solution for this with suffix trees and suffix arrays, but those are annoying, really but, annoying. And but instead of doing that, you can also use this to make a suffix array, which is what we're going to get into. Um, but yeah, so for now, uh, for lexicographically less, yeah, so if you have one as a prefix to the other, you just return, does the first one have smaller length? Um, and if they have equal length, then it's not less, because it can't be equal and less at the same time. You have a total ordering. Um, OK, so otherwise, uh, so speaking of these problems building on each other, we're going to use the code for the last problem. Um, so we're going to find the length of their LCP. Um, so if k is that length, then i plus k and j plus k is going to be the first position where they differ. Uh, so now we're just checking which one's less at the first position where they differ. So that's also just a constant time check. So overall, your runtime for this is log n just to compute the LCP. So sort of a quick example of like how the LCP works with this. If we have these two substrings, their LCP would be ABC. So um, the length is 3. And if we look at i plus 3 and j plus 3, we get d and x which are the first characters that differ. Uh, so we compare lexicographically by just comparing those two characters. OK, and then for code, um, this is also short given the code we had before. Um, so we just do the equality check to see if one's a prefix. And if it is, we return li less than lj. Then we use the LCP, and we do the single character check there. Anyone have any questions about? Uh, lexicographical less. All right, cool. So now, um, yeah, so now we are going to make the suffix array. So we want to create the suffix array of s in n log squared n time. So the suffix array is basically if you take um, all the indices of s, so 0, 1, up to n minus 1, um, and you have sort of a list of them such that uh, for i less than j, um, we have uh, the suffix starting at ai. What did I say? We're going to call this uh, suff from here on out. Um, so the suffix starting at um, si is less than the suffix starting at ji. So basically, you can think of it as a list of your suffixes in lexicographical order. Um, so this is kind of an abstract concept. So we're going to go over a quick example before we get into this. So let's say um, s is the string banana. Um, we basically look at all the suffixes of s. 
right? And now we sort them in lexicographical order and we keep track of what all the starting indices are, right? So the lexicographically least suffix is just A um, and then A and A and then A and A and A. Um, and yeah, so as you can see here, any like two positions, like let's say we pick here and here, we have this one is lexicographically less than this one. And so through all this, we get the suffix array to be this list of indices here. So 531042. Uh, so anyone have any questions about the example? Does the idea of the suffix array make sense? Okay. And again, uh, we want to accomplish this in n log squared n time. There's a very nice solution for this. Uh, don't, um, I don't know. Hey, yeah, Adam, did you have something? Yeah, uh, so you keep uh, a sorted list of all the things that you've inserted so far. Uh, you binary search on that, uh, and your binary search itself is doing the uh, check if it's lexicographically less than. So you have like some kind of, so what, what are you inserting into? Uh, I don't know, like a sort of vector or some shit. Not a vector, okay. I don't know. Like I said, fine. Um, your comparator so is a log squared, like lexicographical you're, comparison. You're very close. Oh no. What do I miss? Why is it dynamic? I, twice. Yeah, I don't think you can do it with this set. Wouldn't that be like O n squared time? n squared log n? Yeah, depending on how you. Did it? Yeah. Wait, why can't I do it with a set and a custom comparator? You you can, um, but your complexity is wrong, and you don't need a set. Why is the complexity wrong? Oh, wait, would that work? It would. The it set would. is going to do log n checks, and each of those checks takes log n. Yeah, that, that's. Oh, I yeah. I guess that so would my complexity work. is right. Oh, you should but, you should okay. compare it with log n. But there's a better way to do it. Yeah. Can't you use any sorting method that's n log n? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so. So what you can do is um, you make some suffix array. You make some array self to hold the suffix array. You initialize suff i equals i for all i. And then you can just use the built-in sort function uh, using a custom comparator that uh, compares suffixes lexicographically. So what we did in the last problem. Um, and so this will use uh, n log n of those comparisons that we just did in the last problem, uh, each of which takes log n time. So the runtime is n log squared n. Um, and the implementation for this is very nice in C++. You can do it in basically two lines. Um, so this function iota, what it does is for everything in this range, so basically for every uh, i such that i is greater than 0 and less than n, um, it sets suff i equals i plus 0. So you can put some other value in here if you want to do like stuff i equals i plus three, you could put three in there. But for this case, we just need stuff i equals i, so we put zero there. Um, and then once you have this, all you do is you just sort stuff using this custom comparator um, that uses this lex less function that we just defined. And note that the length of the suffix starting at i is going to be n minus i. Because like if you're starting index n minus one, that's length one. All right, uh, any questions about this implementation or the approach? Cool. Hey, are we going to go over problems that use suffix arrays? Like, uh, I have one at the end. OK. Yeah. And Wait, also, is there a nicer way of writing that function, like with a lambda or something? That is a lambda. 
That is a limit? There's not like a more compact way of writing that? What do you mean? Like, how, how would you make it more compact? Yeah, that I don't seems know. very compact. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you get... All these parts seem Java like has something slightly nicer, I think. Java? Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Joe, does this work? I, I don't think this compiles. You need to capture N in your Lambda. Oh, um, just because I have N as global. But yeah, okay, if you okay. don't have N as a global, you need to put it in there. You just draw an N sign and that also works in, uh, in the square brackets. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think in Java you can do some shit where you, you like do parentheses IJ and you make an arrow symbol into a function or some shit. I don't remember precisely. Insane. Oh, oh, that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So there's nicer lambda syntax in C++ where it did not where the return types or the parameter types are auto and stuff. And like C++ 17 and 20 have like nicer ways sort of of like writing return types and parameters. Maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm okay. 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 All right. Okay. So now um, we want to query whether arbitrary substrings of S are k periodic in constant time. So we're going to say a string is k-periodic if si equals i plus k uh, for all i, where like that makes sense, right? So i has to be in the bounds of the string, and i plus k has to be in the bounds of the string. So for example, um, if we have this string uh, and with k equals 3, and we're looking at the full string, uh, the answer would be yes. Because um, if you look at it, this string is basically just abc repeated over and over again. So you have a string of length k repeated. Whereas, um, like here, if you look at these four characters, the B A B A, that's not going to be three periodic, because you have uh, S zero is B, or I guess S one is B, um, and S four is A, so they don't match, so they don't satisfy this criteria. So we want uh, constant time for this. So this one um, doesn't really depend on any of the previous ones. This, this one's kind of on its own. Joe, you and Akeep came up with this, right? Like the way to do it with this? Joe did. I yeah. Do with it. He's really smart. I think we it's did this like at Hack Are You, right? No, this wasn't Hack Are You, was it? I think so. We were in the basement, Maybe. right? No, no, this was. No, because I remember, like. We, I remember using this... it there. Maybe you guys came up with it before that. Yeah, I think we did this in, like, command. I don't know. So you can actually get this down to a single equality check. So you just make it into like strings of size K and then check that. Oh, so well, that would take- I think I have an idea. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, could you multiply the hash of the one that's currently selected and by the, uh, like, basically you're comparing the hash between the current one and the hash of the entire rest of the string? 
with yeah, it's like some multiple of the first one. So yeah, like in, right in the track. first case, like you'd be multiplied by three, I guess. You're you're close. But it has to be multiplied by some factor of p too, right? You can actually do it without any multiplication in like one equality check. It's very nice. Don't you do but, um? Yeah. You do from i to l minus k, and then i plus k to l. I I don't know yeah. if I, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what you can do is, um, so first, if l is less than or equal to k, then the string is trivially going to be k periodic because you have less than k characters, right? Otherwise, what we're going to do is basically chop the last k characters off, and also chop the first k characters off. And now we just have to check if those two strings are equal, right? Because for any i such that i plus k is in the string, like let's say we pick this i, or I guess start at the first one, let's say we pick this i, by comparing these two strings, we're checking if this character equals this character, which is i plus k. And we're also checking if this character equals this character, which is i plus k. And you sort of iterate down the whole string, um, and you're doing all those equality checks at once by doing this one compare. So does that make sense? Any questions? Wait, is k guaranteed to be like, would this work if k was like much smaller than the length? Like, yeah, uh, because you're still only doing one compare. Because you're just chopping off the last k, chopping off the first k, and then. So for example, out. if k was one, what I'm asking is, is everything the same character? So what I'd be doing is I'd query mm -hmm. the first l minus one things and the last l minus one things. I'm checking if they're equal. So what that is is that for it to be equal in the first position, the first character has to equal to the second character, and then effectively everything has to be equal. It's the same thing there. Right. And one thing to notice is that this works um, even if it doesn't contain like an integer number of periods, right? Because like this goes A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and then we stop before we have like the third D. Um, so even if you have it like stop anywhere in the middle of the period, um, this will still work because you're still doing all of the equality checks. Okay. Um, so any questions, any more questions about this? All right, so the next problem, we want to do palindrome queries. So take some arbitrary substring, and we want to query whether um, s from i to i plus l is a palindrome in constant time. So basically, does it equal its reverse? So for an example of some queries, we do i equals 0, l equals 1. Um, that string corresponds to a. If we do i equals 3, l equals 3, that corresponds to EGE, is also a palindrome. Uh, but if we do i equals 1, l equals 4, you get this, which is not a palindrome. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. Joe, do you have code okay. for this? Because when I did this, I, it was like horrible. Um, I don't have code for this, but I have like sort of what you would write for this. Like, I don't know. Okay. Isn't this like pretty much the same thing as the last one, except you like flip one of the strings? Like, you like. Wait. Am I making sense? I don't know. I keep talking. Okay, so like, um, so basically, you want to know if the two strings are equivalent, right? So you like, you. You, take you, mean, you mean like, if I if I get a query, I want to know if the first half is equal to the last half, but backwards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you basically just do the same thing you did in the previous problem, except you just have to flip one of the strings. Uh, yeah. So you're sort of. All right, so how would you flip the string? Oh, I have to do this in constant time? OK. Yeah. yeah. So this one is going to kind of use a trick that we haven't seen before in the other problems. Um, in the beginning, would you have to like compute the hashes like twice, like one in like the forward direction, one in the back? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one nice way of doing that is you can sort of take s plus um, like some delimiting character plus the reverse, um, and then just process that. So that way, you only have to keep track of like one hash array and one uh, power array. Well, That's either way, one power array. Um, so yeah, you can basically pre-process this. And then um, what you want to do now is sort of find where the occurrence of um, the substring is in 
the reverse of S. Um, so basically that's going to be at position 2N minus L minus I. Um, so I'm not going to explain exactly how that works. It's just sort of like an off by one calculation sort of thing. But like for one example, let's say this is your S, um, then you would get this as your T. So you take S plus um, dollar sign plus S reversed. And if we get the query uh, I equals two, L equals five, that is this substring. So then we would get two uh, N minus L minus I, where oh, N is the length of S in all of these, even though uh, it's not the length of T. Uh, so then we get two uh, N minus L minus I is nine. So now if we check position two and position nine at length five, these are the two substrings we get. So you get like the copy of the substring in S and then the copy of the substring reversed in um, S reverse. So now all we're doing is we're just checking, does this equal this? Any uh, questions about this? I have two things. One, yeah. your highlights are very nice. I appreciate them. Uh, two, why do I need a dollar sign in the middle? Um, so for this specific problem, it doesn't really matter. Uh, okay. But as I was going through for the next one, okay. I was thinking uh, that you might have some cases where you would need that. Okay. Sure. I don't know. There's probably ways of doing it without the dollar sign, but it's just kind of a nice way to make sure you don't get any weird. Wait, for this particular numbers. problem, all you have to do is change the 2n minus l to 2n minus l minus 1. Minus no, because it, it's still 2n minus l minus i, even if you get rid of the dollar sign. Oh. Wait. Oh, wait. It no, this should have a plus 1. This should have a plus 1. I did this before I added the dollar sign. What? It shouldn't have a plus oh. one. Because if you want the i thing from the back, you take the size minus one minus i. That's the formula. Uh, can you guys see the presentation? It just no. crashed for me. It's gone. OK, let's just go But if you want the i from the back, oh, but then you have the l shit. OK, it could be both of them. OK, nice. Here you go, so. All right. Uh, any other questions about this? I still can't see it, by the way. Wait. Oh, God. Fuck. Escape. All right. Uh, can you guys see it now? It's a little, there we go. It's yeah, you're good now. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, any other questions about this? Cool. All right. So we have two more. So the first one is we want to count how many substrings of S are palindromes in n log n. So for example, um, if you have S is just five A's, then that would be 15 because every substring is a palindrome. Um, and if you have S as this, your answer would be seven uh, because every character on its own is a palindrome plus you have ABA and ACA. So note that you can have an answer that is um, O of n squared. Like in this case, if you have say n a's, you're going to get O of n squared palindromes, right? But we need to compute this in n log n. So one uh, useful hint is to start off by counting only palindromes with odd length. Maybe you guys might think about that. Joe, someone said something in the chat. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically what we're going to do. Um, so for odd length palindromes, we can basically binary search uh, for each index on how big of a palindrome we can get around this index. So what we do is if, if we fix the middle character of the palindrome, we can binary search for the biggest palindrome that's centered around that character. That's smart. And we can do this by uh, using the palindrome querying from the last problem. Um, and so this is why you kind of want to have the dollar sign. Because like, let's say you have um, a string like sort of near the end. Um, you might like overlap and go past. There's, there's definitely ways of getting around it. But that's just sort of a nice way to make sure that doesn't happen. 
So basically what we want is the longest L such that I minus L plus one up to I plus L is a palindrome. So again, this is like off by one stuff. Um, and again, we have to make sure it stays in bounds. And then we just basically take the sum of all L uh, for each I. So what this looks like is let's say we have this string with the middle character as the G. So if we try L equals one, um, we get a, the substring G, which is a palindrome. L equals two, we get E, G, E. So at each step, we're just adding one character on either side. Um, and if we were actually doing this, we wouldn't be doing it like linearly like this, we'd be binary searching on L. But this is just to show that um, it's always going to work until the first point where it doesn't. Um, so yeah, so in this case, we would have three as the maximal L that works. And so we add three, so basically these three strings to our answer. Okay, um, so how would we extend this to even length? You do the same thing basically, right? So you're saying like yeah. the ith guy is like the left middle, uh, but it, it it only works if like the guy next to you, for example, is the same character to me. Right? Exactly. Um, so it's similar to the odd case, except we're not going to iterate over all i. We're only going to iterate over i such that it equals the next guy, like Adam was saying. Um, so now we're binary searching sort of a similar thing, uh, such that s i minus l plus 1, i plus l plus 1 is a palindrome. So it, it would look like very similar to what we have here, but we have an even length palindrome instead of an odd one. OK, and then again, we just add up l for uh, each such i. And this leads us to our solution in general, which is just add up the answers for the odd and even length palindromes. OK. All right, so the last problem um, is we want to count the number of distinct substrings of s in n log squared n time. Um, and the hint is the n log squared n comes from constructing the suffix array. Uh, so for example, if again, you have s equals five a's, there's only five distinct substrings there because every two substrings the same length are equal. Um, whereas if all your characters are different, then every substring is distinct. Um, so then you would have uh, 15 in this case. Basically what you want to do. Um, so what we're going to do is iterate through the suffixes in sorted order um, and keep a running total of how many distinct substrings you've seen. So basically what that means is like for each suffix, how many of its prefixes are um, substrings that we haven't seen before. So every substring of S has to be a prefix of one of its suffixes, right? Does that make sense? Um, the string starting at the first position of the substring and go to the end, that's the suffix of S. And so then your substring is a prefix of that. Um, right, so the, the idea is um, the total number of substrings starting from suff i, where again, suff i is the index in the string um, of the ith smallest thing, um, there's gonna be n minus suff i, right? So it's like, it's like we were saying before, where like n minus i is the number of characters um, in the suffix starting at i. So uh, we start with this number and then we subtract out the ones that we've seen before. Um, and the thing to notice here is that all the substrings we've seen before that are prefixes of suff i must also be prefixes of suff i minus one, um, which means there is exactly LCP suff i, oh, suff um, i minus one substrings that we've seen before. So this is like kind of an abstract way of thinking about it. So we're going to do an example for this. So if your string is Mississippi, right? And let's say you're adding in your, you're at the fourth position. So you're at um, the substring starting position one. So here, and we want to know how many of the prefixes of this string um, are also prefixes of one of these strings. And the claim we're making is that in order for a string to be a prefix of this and a prefix of one of these, it has to be a prefix of this one. 
And the idea is, let's say this one matched more characters. Let's say this was I, S, S, I, S. Then these two would not be in lexicographical order because you'd have S here and P here, and P is less than S. So the idea is to get all the strings that we have seen before by processing these, um, we just take the LCP of this with the last one. So in his, uh, for example, in this case, uh, as we're adding this one, I, I need to stop doing that. Uh, we get six new substrings. Oh God. Why is it? I was not clicking. Whatever. So uh, for this, we get six new substrings, right? Because you have these. Oh my God. Probably. So my slides just crashed. Um, yeah. What is? Is um, n times n plus one over two. Because that's just the total number of substrings. Oh, that's over two. Because that's just total number of substrings, right? Um, so now we can just, as our answer, we can just take, um, this, I have absolutely no idea how moving things works in this, but we're going to find out. Oh, it's working. So now, um, oh. Your answer is just this. Oh, this is a plus. This is not a times. No, this is a minus. Sorry. What am I doing? Okay, there we go. So now um, you can just take this as your answer. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? I know this is not the optimal way for me to be doing this, but. All right, uh, cool. So that was all I had in terms of problems. So I guess we're done now. Um, so if we still have the slides at this point, um, I would show you guys all the links I have at the end. So I have links to uh, like a template for just normal string hashing. Uh, wait, can you guys hear me? My green circle was looking weird. No, you're good. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. you're good. Um, okay, so it, I have links to like a normal string hashing template and one with the suffix array. Uh, plus a couple nice like code forces blogs about it, um, as well as some cool problems that use this. Um, so once Drive comes back, we will post the slides um, on the Discord. And if you guys are interested in uh, doing some more practice, you can look at those problems, uh, look at the templates, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, I guess we're done. So thank you guys for coming. Um, do we know what our meeting next week will be about? No, I don't think so. OK, we'll, we'll figure that out in the next couple of days and send out an email. But yeah, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. All right.